or is associated with this uh, high level of production of uh, unrest. And the second thing uh, that has to, to do with public policy and, 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 and political institutions, and that has, and, the, and this argument is the argument that uh, public unrest is a method of political bargaining in the Greek context. And at the micro level, I'm going to look at in individual choices. I'm going to argue that what explains uh, participation in riots is the very low level of public sanction. <coughs> the fact that uh, it's very easy, it's cheap, it's free uh, to participate in uh, violent activity. Uh, and a possible synthesis of those two macro and micro elements is an argument that uses a term that has been developed in the context of Indian politics to explain very, very different types of riots, but I think the term actually uh, help us you know, understand the Greek case better, which uh, is the term institutionalized riot system. I'm going to argue that riots were, uh, until recently, uh, an institutional part of the Greek political system, a part of Greek political institutions. Uh, let's turn to political culture. The root of that tradition, and I'm using the term very specifically of uh, rioting, I think is the uh, Polytechnic Uprising in 1973, which became the main element, the main event that's associated uh, with uh, uh, the dictatorship and the period of the dictatorship. Um, one can argue um, the value um, and, and, and the extent to which um, that has uh, been a key element of, uh, of Greek um, political understand self-understanding and self-consciousness. And it, it may be possible to argue that perhaps because a Greek society was uh, in many ways uh, very receptive uh, or uh, did not really produce high levels of resistance against the dictatorship, that perhaps this single event uh, has received all this attention. Uh, and, and so uh, there is a repertoire of contention which is very much, in a sense, you know, using the elements uh, that became uh, established uh, and, and that became prominent during those uh, uh, events. And of course, there is a tradition of celebrating uh, the student uprising uh, in uh, the 17th of November. Uh, there has always been an emphasis in the heroic dimension of the student revolt uh, and the key role of the students uh, in saving the honor of a society that otherwise uh, was very happy to live uh, with the dictatorship. Um, and of course, uh, since then, there's been a stress uh, on public protests uh, confronting the state uh, and, and seeing the state as the enemy. Uh, and there's been a, a very wide acceptance of public un uh, protest, especially uh, uh, disruptive public <coughs> protest, as a, a, a perfectly <coughs> acceptable way uh, of expressing political concern in a way uh, that one does not find in many other countries. I was hoping to have some public opinion data to show you the differences from various societies about the level of public acceptance of uh, disruptive public protest. I don't have it, unfortunately, but there is quite a striking um, variation in that respect. Uh, given the prominence uh, in the uh, political history of the post-dictatorship uh, Greece of the polytechnic events, uh, in a sense, you could say that every generation has been conditioned to, uh, you know, really wanting to have its own polytechnic, even, even though, of course, the regime is a democratic regime rather than an autocracy. That has been visible uh, in the fact that there's been a very broad social and political acceptance, especially by the media, uh, of those activities. Uh, uh, and the coverage has always been very supportive. The uh, understanding is that uh, people who participate, especially students participating in public protests, are not seen as people who are placed themselves outside the realm of political legitimacy, but on the contrary, as people who express the very core of what it means to be a politically active citizen. Uh, and in a sense, I would argue that uh, participating in events uh, that are associated with this method of political activity became a rite of passage, that every generation had to have it's you know big event, uh, a, a way of becoming politically an adult. And of course, uh, it's no coincidence that a lot of the journalists who, in a sense, see those events as really being positive, came of age precisely at the time of the Polytechnic School Uprising and afterwards were themselves participants in those events. Uh, one of the uh, elements that I think characterizes this process is 
the tradition of school occupations, which developed uh, in the 1980s and became uh, very common in the 1990s. The present leader of uh, one of the radical left parties, uh, I'm talking about Tsipras, was in fact became politically active as a leader of the school occupations of the early 1990s. And so there is also a cohort effect in which people get socialized in those practices and then become uh, very prominent as political leaders. Uh, and, and what is very funny always is the phenomenon of pretend school occupations in which students occupy the school, but then they don't want to stay there, so they go home. The school is occupied. <laughs> so they have all the events uh, in the, uh, without having the, the cost of actually spending the, uh, the evening there. And of course, there is an institutional dimension which has to do with the role of political party youth organizations in the running and operation of public universities in Greece. Uh, which explains why political parties have an incentive in keeping alive uh, organizations that uh, organize students and, and sometimes give them as an opportunity the, you know, this opening to, uh, you know, kind of aggressive university politics. Uh, there is an interesting paper, I'm going to discuss a couple of papers that use systematic data from the Greek case. This is a paper by two young Greek political scientists, Elias Linas and Kostas Yemenis, unpublished, came out in 2011. It, the title says, you know, uh, signals the content. It was all fun after all, the role of process incentives as a determinant of university students' protest. It's the first study that I know in which a questionnaire was administered, a survey of students who participated and did not participate in university, in university occupations uh, I think in uh, 2006, uh, in uh, various great universities. Uh, so what do they find? They find uh, that individual decisions to participate in university occupation are driven by what they call an entertainment factor. Uh, our findings, is the conclusion, point out that the magnitude of the effect of the entertainment factor, that is the pleasure that is derived from participating in those activities, is very strong. In the absence of perceived benefits associated with the, protest, the process of protesting, the importance of attaining uh, the public good becomes much less important uh, in the decision to participate in that process. That is, uh, the participation is not driven by the expectation that the protests are going to produce some outcome. They are driven by the process itself. Right? It's the participation itself that generates the pleasure rather than a sort of instrumental perception about what you can get out of it. Um, second element that I want to emphasize, moving away from political culture, is the, the element of bargaining uh, politics. Uh, and I'm going to argue that disruptive protests, not riots in general, but dis disruptive protests, protests that reaches a high level of magnitude, has been uh, a key element in Greek public policy making. Uh, and um, it is a way through which both groups articulate demands but also a way through which, uh, in a sense, the political system has been legitimized into providing a variety of group level benefits to the groups that are able to stage uh, these mass uh, kinds of protests, especially the extraction of rents. Uh, and there is, no there is no coincidence that the groups that have been much more active in organizing disruptive protests are the groups who expect to get public benefits, especially public servants and farmers who have been able to extract rents uh, in the form of subsidies or in the form of benefits uh, from the state. Uh, and there is a, a very close connection between political parties on the one hand, trade uh, unions of the public sector and, and farmer, farmers unions on the other hand. And the process of participating and creating those uh, protests is both a signal of strength but also a way for the politicians and the political system to justify uh, the, uh, uh, rewards, the rewards and benefits that are given. Uh, in that respect, one thinking of the distinction that I made at the beginning of the talk, riots can be seen as parasitic to protests, and one of the characteristics of riots in Greece is that very often they tend to take place in the context of larger protests, which are not composed of rioters. So the rioters are a small group uh, who take advantage of public protests, but they tend to be accepted, the riots, by the, you know, the, the wider uh, mass of protesters, especially the leaders of those protests who perceive that this raises the ante and creates and puts more pressure on the government for the extraction of benefits. Um, however, this system, this process has, has reached a dead end. Because since 2010, and since the uh, fact, the actual bankruptcy of, of the Greek uh, public sector, the state can no longer deliver 
uh, those benefits. And so the system, which was in a sense extremely institutionalized, uh, in spite of looking so anarchic and chaotic, especially to outside obser observers, that system no longer works. And that has created a situation in which public protest, in a sense, has gone mad. Uh, uh, people continue to use the same language, but the system can no longer deliver. And that creates a disconnect, which I think is essential for understanding how this process has developed. What do we know in terms of empirical evidence? There is a very interesting unpublished paper uh, by Wolfgang Brudig and uh, Georgios Kaliotis, who protest in Greece mass opposition to austerity 2010. And this is the only paper that I know that is based on a survey of both protesters and non-protesters. I'm not talking about riots, I'm talking about major protests. And these are protests that are associated with the first measures of austerity in 2010. Uh, it's a large, protest, a large survey uh, that includes about 1,000 respondents uh, and finds that 30% of those respondents engage in some form uh, of protest activity in 2010. The findings are very interesting. What are the non-predictors? That is, the characteristics that distinguish people who participated and people who did not participate. Well, the worsening of personal financial situation is not a predictor of participation in public protest. Civic association <coughs> membership is not a predictor uh, in participation. Efficacy beliefs, the belief that by protesting you can win something, is not a predictor. The people who believe that you can actually win something do not participate. The people who believe you cannot win anything by protesting do not participate. But the most important and interesting finding is that there is no connection between the shock, the personal shock on the one hand, and participation on the other hand. What are the main predictions according to this analysis? Employment in the public sector, trade union membership, leftist political views. These are the main predictors. So it's a political, I would argue, rather than a purely social uh, process. And what they argue, they characterize participation uh, in protests as a non-politics phenomenon. There's a discussion whether uh, participating in protests is, is a new kind of behavior. There's been a very convincing argument, for example, that Occupy Wall Street movements have, are an expression of a new form of political participation. Well, they argue in this paper that in Greece, it's not an expression of a new form. It's rather an expression of this older form. Who riots? What do we know about rioting? Finally, to conclude uh, by looking at the most extreme form of uh, violent activity. Uh, we don't really have data, and it's very difficult to obtain data from the police. I even doubt that the police really keeps any systematic data. Uh, this is just uh, as a sort of very superficial way, a description of the only 17-9 arrests that took place in February 2012. So what do we know from those arrests? The majority are Greek, but there is quite a large percentage of uh, participation by non-Greeks. are mostly young, uh, but, you know, 60%, uh, almost 60%, 56% of the uh, people who were arrested uh, for those, in those protests are older than 29. And there is a huge variety in terms of professional background. It's not really the unemployed or the students or the the youth. It's, it's a much more complex kind of demographic profile. The problem with arrests is that it's a very biased sample. People get arrested and not representative of the people who riot and sometimes have elements that make them especially unrepresentative. My sense is that foreigners are much more represented among those arrested than those, among those who riot. Uh, one, you know, using descriptions of protests would argue that you can distinguish between circles, cycles of uh, participants in riots. You can, you have a, a very hardcore cycle of, you know, people, self-styled revolutionaries or veteran rioters, people who participate very often, uh, who see themselves as the, uh, the avant-garde of revolutionaries. Around them you have a circle of politically motivated people who may participate in riots only when those riots take on a wider uh, form. These are probably leftists, uh, revolutionaries, but not you know, the most extreme kind of anarchists. Then you have uh, people who you know, tag on because it's great to be able to break things without even having necessarily a very clear political agenda in their head. And then you have all kinds of other people who have issues with the police. So, uh, soccer hooligans in Greece fight against the police in stadiums, so the opportunity to fight against the police in a different setting seems to be something that is attractive. So a lot of people who observe those things very often see uh, those people who do not necessarily have a political agenda tagging along. Um, and what is very interesting is also to think about how those things have evolved. I don't have data, and therefore I cannot really say anything about 
the evolution of rioting in the last three years, but certainly what is going on is a process of socialization of younger people into that uh, set of uh, participation. Um, I would argue that the main element explaining the decision to riot has to do with the, not just the push factors, but also the pull factors, and especially the absence of sanction. That is, the opportunity costs uh, of time and the potential costs of punishment, which are shown in a variety of other studies in other countries to drive participation in rioting, uh, I, th I think are fully consistent with the level of participation of rioting in Greece. In fact, the puzzle is, and the question in Greece, given the level of sanction, is not why people participate in rioting, is why not many more people not participate in rioting, given how easy and how costless it is to do that. Uh, to say that it's a low-risk activity, I, I would argue, is an understatement. Uh, the anarchist milieu, which is really the people who take the initiative, the anarchist milieu is a very kind of generic term, it is a small group of people, it's not very large. Uh, the, what is very interesting in terms of police data is the level of, you know, the, of, of low intensity activity that is almost unbroken. Uh, between 1998 and 2010, there's, there's been almost 6,000 fire bombings recorded. Uh, so there's a very large process that keeps those groups going on. And, and so when major protests happen, those groups continue to exist. During the same period, there's, always, there's only been 20 successful trials conducted for 6,000 uh, acts. Uh, in the period after the beginning of the crisis, 2010 to 2012, Almost 1,300 arrests, no trials so far, uh, and of course, you know, that gives you the, the sense of the problem. The, the justice system really is the problem. Even people who get arrested almost never get tried, or the trials get uh, uh, planned for such a long-term future uh, that they, in fact, correspond to the absence. And this is a general problem with justice, not a problem with, uh, with rioting, in general, the Greek justice system is completely blocked and is unable really to process uh, cases. And this is one of the central problems that Greece has to address in order to be able to move into the direction of development, the absence of the justice system. Um, what explains this very poor level of, Greek, of, of the state's response to rioting? Incompetence, incompetence would be the, the, the most obvious point. Uh, the argument about political culture and politics of bargaining in the background uh, certainly play a role, up to recently at least. <coughs> Let me conclude with some uh, general uh, points that, and, and just recapitulating some of those points. Uh, as I said, in the comparative uh, arena, uh, trying to understand in general the links between public unrest and mass public uh, and, and, and economic crisis, the, the, uh, the evidence is very mixed. It's very difficult to say that there is a clear connection between those two things. Uh, and I, you know, using the evidence from the Greek case, I'm, as I pointed out, I'm willing to entertain the hypothesis that perhaps the main mediating factor is the strength of left-wing militancy. Wherever you have a very strong uh, left-wing uh, organizations, and mostly political organizations rather than union membership, and that would be the example of France. France has a tradition of left-wing militancy along with very, very low levels of union membership. You may be getting uh, this type of uh, situation. Uh, and so the, the final point that I would like to make uh, is that the Greek case, precisely because of those factors that make it so specific, uh, is very interesting to study and is worth thinking about, but should not be generalized in a sort of unproblematic fashion to really uh, represent the future of Europe. I think one has to be very careful when projecting or extrapolating what is going on in Greece to the rest of Europe, at the very least, one has to study the Greek case in a comparative perspective with the Portuguese and Irish cases and try to understand what explains the difference between those three cases, which are undergoing a similar process of economic restructuring. So uh, I'm sure that uh, I gave you a lot of food for, food for thought. I'm sure that you, uh, a lot of you know much more than I do, and I'm very happy to have uh, a discussion.